some of these parents would call Jeannie and me and say, how, how did you deal with the empty nest? I mean, you had twins, the boys were, we had like instant empty nest. Took them off to school, came back, and we were by ourselves. And I told them, I said, it takes you about, about three hours. <laughs> you know, there's milk in the refrigerator. You know where your ties are. It's uh, <laughs> gas in the car. It's an amazing thing. You get your girlfriend back, it's nice. I told the boys, I said, for 18 years, your mom's first question to me, where are the boys, how are the boys, what are the boys doing? Now she actually asks about me. It's nice. So, <laughs> This is the sermon that was supposed to have been preached on the Sunday we were flooded out. And so we rescheduled everything and got everything lined up. Then we woke up this morning to driving rain. <laughs> and I've carefully gone through the whole list and seen what's in common. Who can we find out that's jinxing this? Is there somebody under judgment or something? And I'm pretty much the only thing in common with all of these services. So it, it just may be me. <laughs> all of us have families. You can choose your friends, but your family, you're just stuck with. They're there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And no matter how far away you move from your point of, of, of family, from the point of your birth, you carry them with you everywhere. People who stay up late at night and study group dynamics say that the first thing a group does is form the group. Hey, you kind of decide, I want to be in this group. The second part, the second stage is called the grinding process. The grinding process is you have sharp edges, I have sharp edges, and we get together in the closest of a group, those sharp edges hit, and they round each other's sharp edges off so we can have the group and be together. Uh, what they don't tell you is all that bumping together creates a lot of friction and sparks that need forgiving. Things get said. Words get spoken, things done, that wound hurt. Most of us have a really hard time with forgiveness because we don't understand what forgiveness is. We think forgiveness is never thinking about it anymore, and that's not it. Forgiveness. Well, forgiveness is shown to us in one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. It's chapter 45 of the book of Genesis. Stand with me as we read this story. We see what Joseph understood about the power of forgiveness. Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants, so he called out, send everyone away from me, and no one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. So he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and all of Pharaoh's household heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were too terrified to answer him. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. Now don't be worried or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve your life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and it'll be five more years without plowing or harvesting. Now God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore it was not you who sent me here but God. He's made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Return quickly to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord out of all of Egypt. Come down to me without delay. You can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me. You and your children and grandchildren, your sheep, your cattle, and all that you have. There I will sustain you, for there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you, your household, everything you have will become destitute. Look. Look, your eyes and my brother Benjamin's eyes, you can see it is I, Joseph, who is speaking to you. Tell my father about my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen and bring my father here quickly. Then Joseph threw his arms around Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder, and Joseph kissed each of his brothers. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it. Believe it and live. Let's pray together. You 
came, Lord Jesus, to per preach release to the captives, liberty to the oppressed. I understand it is not your will that any of us be held captive, bondage, slaves to the past, to unforgiveness. So we pray, Father, in your grace that you would set all of us free this morning. We pray this in your name. You're familiar with Joseph and the story of his brothers. Joseph was the, famous, the, the favorite son of Jacob. And you know the story about how Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors. Uh, and, and we love that, um, that image of Joseph showing up in his technicolor kind of, of outfit to, to, to aggravate his brothers. Really, the, the, the better translation is a coat of long sleeves. Uh, a coat with long sleeves was a coat given to somebody who did not do work. It was a supervisor's coat, a manager's work, an owner's coat. Uh, if you were working, you had on a different kind of coat that had no sleeves. That way your arms would not be encumbered when you worked with the grain or when you um, dealt with the animals. Uh, but Joseph was given a coat by his father. So when he would show up and the brothers would be out there sweating in the field, he would walk up and go, nah, 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 nah. Daddy said, I didn't have to do any chores. Well, I'm an older brother. I have a little brother. I can tell you that didn't work well. Not only that, but Joseph, Joseph, well, he was narcissistic. Let's just be honest. He was. He kept having the, it's one thing to have dreams. Some dreams you just don't need to share with anybody. But he would get all his brothers around going, guys, I keep having these crazy dreams about all of you guys coming to me and bowing down. Isn't that funny? Ha ha. So, Joe's uh, big brothers do what big brothers do. They, they plan to kill him. <laughs> it seemed to make sense. In fact, they had a long discussion about how to kill him, and the discussion went on so long, they decided they didn't have time to kill him, so they'd throw him in a hole and hold him there until they figured out how they were going to kill him. Uh, then they figured out if we kill him, we don't make any money, but if we sell him, then we can make some money. There was a group of slave traders going by on a trade route, so they sold Joseph. Now, when I taught this series at Kairos, the Kairos kids were really excited about the possibilities of selling brothers and sisters. That kind of uh, helped them a lot. All of us have had that moment where if somebody offered us a buck and a half for our little brother or little sister, they were gone. And Joseph is gone. They tell Jacob that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. Jacob grieves for his favorite son and thinks he has lost Joseph forever. But the adventure for Joseph was just beginning. He is bought by an Egyptian military officer named Potiphar. Uh, he gains Potiphar's trust. He begins to take care of all of Potiphar's household details. He just runs Potiphar's uh, life for him. Potiphar didn't have to worry about anything. He also caught the eye of Potiphar's wife, who put a move on him. When he did not participate in the affair, Potiphar's wife ratted him out. Your servant made a pass at me. I demand that you treat your servant. So Potiphar had Joseph thrown in jail. That seems to be Potiphar's way of telling Joseph, I know what happened. I'm married to this woman, so I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to throw you in jail. And Joseph languished in jail. One of the things that happened to Joseph in jail is that he met two servants of Pharaoh. Both, both of these servants had dreams. One dreamed about his execution, and Joseph said, this is what your dream means, and indeed that servant was executed. The other one had a dream about being restored to power, and Joseph said that you will be restored to power, and that did happen, and Joseph asked, when you do get there, remember me. Well, the guy didn't. The last thing he wanted to bring up to Pharaoh was, I was in jail once, remember? Pharaoh has a series of dreams about fat cows and lean cows and nobody can figure it out. Finally, the servant remembers Joseph. There's a guy in jail who can interpret dreams. So I'm told. They go get Joseph. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream and Pharaoh is so impressed by Joseph's wisdom, by his understanding that he puts Joseph in charge of everything. Now Joseph puts together a series of plans where everybody is growing their grain and a lot of that grain is brought into Egypt's storehouses in preparation for the famine. 
Seven good years are followed by seven years of famine. Egypt is the only nation in the world with food. Everybody is coming to Egypt to buy food. Joseph is selling the food to everybody, and he is making Pharaoh rich. No wonder Pharaoh loved Joseph. In the line to buy food, Joseph recognizes his brothers. They don't recognize him. He's been totally brought into the culture of Egypt. For all they know, Joseph is an Egyptian. Joseph understands their language. When they talk to each other, he understands what they're saying, but he doesn't give in, doesn't show any hand, anything in his hand. He just watches. He puts them through a series of tests. He accuses them of being spies. He, he demands that Benjamin be brought, and when Benjamin is brought, he stuffs um, cups and stuff into Benjamin's sack, accusing Benjamin of being a thief. Uh, and he puts his brothers through all these kinds of tests to see if they have changed at all. And finally, when he decides what to do, this is a moment of high drama with a gesture, a raised eyebrow, a nod of the head. His security detail would have fallen on his brothers and killed them without mercy right in front of him. That's all it would have taken for Joseph. Just that. It had been over. Story over. I, I have told you more than once what I would have done had I been Joseph. I would have been stood up and I would have made them listen to Toby Keith's How Do You Like Me Now? <laughs> I'd have had the whole band, the laser lights, but they'd had to watch the whole song. How do you like me now? That's not what Joseph did. <coughs> Joseph forgave. Now understand, Joseph had been sold like yard sale junk. Languished in prison, suffered unjustly, but he forgave his brothers. He understands some things about forgiveness that we need to get one. Joseph under, understood that the hurt was his. It was up to him to forgive. See, we all, you, you often hear people say, this happened, I got hurt, my feelings hurt, I'm wounded, and as soon as they say they're sorry, I will forgive them. That's not the way forgiveness works. Forgiveness is offered whether or not the person ever asks for it. Here is a short definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness is releasing the other person from the expectation that they can fix what they did. They can't. Okay, now, I, Jeannie and I have been married almost 30 years now. That, that's long enough for me to get in trouble. I, I know that shocked to y'all, but sometimes I do not so smart things. And I, and I will say something, or I will do something, I will forget something, and it will hurt Jeannie's feelings. And I will apologize, and I will apologize, and I will apologize. Please, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And she will, and she'll know I'm sincere. She'll know I didn't mean to do it. But you know what? All of my apologies doesn't take the hurt out of her heart. The hurt's there. And now it's hers to deal with. If you have been hurt, if somebody's betrayed you, let you down, if somebody has wounded you, that hurt is now yours and it is yours to deal with. But Mike, that's not fair. No, it's not. But let's just stop right now and praise God. He doesn't deal with us on terms of fairness. Nobody gets what they deserve. And we always pray that other people will get justice and we pray that we ourselves will get mercy. How grateful I am that when I pray for forgiveness, Jesus doesn't say, Mike, that's not fair. It's not fair. It's grace. And I'm going to release the person from the expectation that they can fix what they did. No matter what Joseph's brothers did, they could not give him back one minute of time that he spent in jail. They can't give back the lie that they told to their father about Joseph being alive. They can't give any of that back. It's now up to Joseph, and Joseph deals with it. Now, how do you do that? Somebody hurts you, and you have this hurt. What, what do you do? Uh, they can't fix it. You pray. Now, I know you're kind of going, oh, great, because most of us have a prayer life that kind of ends with, now I lay me down to sleep. 
But if you read the prayer life of the great saints, you will read about people who struggled with Jesus in person. They go to him. This is not fair. This is what happened. This is where I've been hurt. This is where I've been betrayed. And I give all of that ugliness to Jesus. And I understand that he is the only one that can heal that. I tell you all the time, one of the things that makes my eyes go buggy about God is that God doesn't wear a watch or carry a calendar. He's not limited by time space. Uh, he is in the future waiting on us. The future's already done. Do you get that? The future is done. He's waiting on us to get there. He is in our present. He is still in our past. Now, what does that mean? That means he, can, he is in that moment when the words were said that cut your soul like a sword when the thing was done where you were betrayed and you collapsed in that moment, you said, I'll never get over this. I'll never be able to deal with it. Jesus is still in that moment. So when you go back in your memory and say, this is where I was, this is what have happened, he's still there. And he can heal that wound so it doesn't bleed into the present. Amen. He's the only one that can do that. And that takes prayer. That takes a lot of prayer. That takes a lot of being honest with how you feel and what's going on. But I understand that nobody else can make that better. Jesus is going to have to be the one to heal me. And it's like a spiral. I keep coming back to this issue, but at a different level. We always think it's once and done. It's never that way. Not authentic forgiveness. It's a process. And sometimes it takes a long time to get to the place of total release. But Joseph understood the hurt was his. The first moment of forgiveness was his to speak. Second thing, Joseph, Joseph understood his life in the greater context of what God was doing. Joseph told his brothers, what you meant for evil, God has meant for good. You sold me, but do not worry about what you did to me. God was using that to bring me to a place where not one nation will be saved from starvation, but two nations will be saved from starvation. And this will be one of the stories that the people of faith tell about how God provided for his people, even when everybody else saw there was no way out. Joseph was already put into a place. Now, you and I are going, with, boy, that's a rough way to be put into a place to be used. Uh, we'd like to be driven there in a limo. He goes to jail. He's falsely accused. He's abused. He goes through all of this hurt and, 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 and all of that just to be put in a place where God was working. But the greater plan was that there was a nation to be saved from starvation, and Joseph was there, had earned the right to be there, and he was there to take care of his family when they would have starved to death without him. One of the things that you and I don't understand is how big and how good our God is and how strong our God is to take anything that the world throws at us and use it in a way that will bring glory and honor to his kingdom. We do dumb things. We make mistakes. We fail. We sin. God is a good enough God. He can keep working in your life, keep kneading that dough so that it keeps working no matter what you put into your recipe. When somebody else throws something in your recipe, it's not always us, is it? When somebody else throws something into your life, our God is so good, he can keep working it so that at the end of the day, when you pull it out of the oven, it tastes good. Romans 8, all things are working together. So that things that you think are mistakes, the worst things ever in your life, you things, that things that people did to you, and you think, I'll never get over this, they become the very first line of your testimony. When somebody says... Has God done anything in your life? You stand up and tell about the worst thing that ever happened to you because it becomes the opportunity for God to continue to work. And some of you have been in situations where you've walked by a couple talking, two people talking, and you've overheard a conversation, and somebody it was in the place now where you used to be, and you stepped over and said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to overhear, but I know exactly where you are. And I want to tell you what God did for me. And a few chapters later, when Jacob dies and the brothers are afraid, you just did this because you love our dad. And now that our dad's gone, there's nobody to protect us from you. Joseph brings his brothers in and says, what you meant for evil, what you did to hurt me, God has used for good. The world threw the apostle Paul in prison that's bad. He couldn't preach. How else was somebody like Paul going to sit still long enough to write the letters that we now call Scripture? What the world meant for evil, God 
meant for good. Third thing. Third thing. If, Jake, if Joseph did not forgive his brothers, he would have never seen his father again. Forgiveness was the way that he saw his father. Some of you are swallowing hard right now, aren't you? Because you have held on to bitterness, you have held on to anger. And you wonder why your prayers don't feel like they used to. Wonder why your life doesn't have the same kind of connection that it used to have. Wonder why you don't have the faith you used to have and it is forgiveness that separates you. Unforgiveness that separates you. Forgive us our debts, Jesus says in Matthew 6 as we forgive those, as we forgive those who are in debt to us. The only way to the Father? Forgiveness. I have told you several times about um, how I got into a deeper prayer life. Several years ago, uh, I was invited by the Lord, I believe, into a deeper prayer life. It was, it was no, there was no guilt. I wasn't um, shamed into it. I wasn't held over hell like a marshmallow or anything that Baptists usually do. It was just simply an invitation. And I knew it was invitation. I want you to come deeper. I, and I wanted to. You know what I said? No. No, I, I won't do that. And I, and I told Jesus in my, in my prayer time, for once, for once, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not going to make a big promise to you. I've made big promises to you a million times. I haven't kept one of them, not one. It's a little embarrassing. And the last thing in the world I want to do now is to make another promise to you that I won't keep. So let's just be honest. Let's just say I'm doing about as well as I'm going to do. You know, I, you know, I, I know me. I make a big plan. I make a big project. And I hang in there for about two weeks. Week three, back to the old me. That's embarrassing. And I was honest about it. I can't do that. I'd love to make that promise. I'd love to say that, but I just, I just can't. And you know how the Lord answered me? The Lord asked, can you do it for 30 days? Well, I can stand on my head for 30 days. No lifetime? No, 30 days. So I made a 30-day commitment. Now, that's been 10, 11 years ago, and I'm still doing it 30 days at a time. So at the end of May, May 31, I'll re-up for June. But I'm under no commitment past May 31. <laughs> I know you want more from your pastor. I know you want me to be in 30 days at a time is all I got. So the end of May, 1st of June, I'll re-up. I've been doing that 10, 11 years now. Here's a story I haven't told you. I'd been in that process for several months. Uh, things were changing. It was the most transforming time. People were coming up to me asking what I was doing different how I, and asking how I had changed certain things, and, and I didn't know I had changed. One morning, I got up, I opened my Bible, and it was as cold in the room as I have ever felt a room be. I have never felt more alone than I did in that moment. And I panicked. What did I do wrong? What, how, how have I lost this? What, why did I mess up? You know, here it is. I can't even do it 30 days right. And, and in that quiet moment, I heard the Lord tell me, we need to talk about this. And he named it. See, like many of you, I too have been hurt, betrayed, wounded. And I held on to it like a trophy. And when I was alone, I would get it out and I would polish it. I would make sure it was still hurt. 
And I would say to myself, you would do great things for God if you had not been hurt. <laughs> Suffer. Boy, there's nothing better for a Baptist than good, righteous anger, is there? When you know the other person's at fault, and it's not, boy, I can, we can wear that out. But silly me. I thought you could put ice in your heart without your heart freezing. And in that moment, the Lord says to me, we're going to talk. About it. No, that's off limits. You knew it was off limits. You knew when I started this process, we weren't going to go here. No. We're going to talk about it. No, we're not either. Yeah, we are. And finally, the Lord says, don't you understand? The anger you hold in your heart is taking up the place where I want to be. You can hold on to me or you can hold on to your anger but you can't hold both. You can hold on to Jesus or you can hold on to your anger but you can't hold This is where it gets hard. Because every one of us have to deal with this. Not one is immune from this one. Every one of us. So we're coming now to a time of response. We're coming now to a, this prayer time. And maybe your prayer is as simple as writing it down. Maybe the person sitting next to you knows the story. And it would be a touch of the hand or a touch on the shoulder this person will know to pray for you. If you need to move and get up and find somebody to pray with you, you do that. And that's one of the things we do. We bear each other's burdens. There are some hurts that are too big to carry by yourself. So you do that. That means some of you will come and, and ask somebody to pray with you. Now, Today, we're going back to the old way. I'm going to go back to the parlor. Parlor's a room, for those of you who are new, it's right across the, the, the vestibule, the hallway there, and I'm back there. And I'm going back there because I, I, I want to listen. I want to hear what you're saying, and it helps me to pay attention back there, kind of off the, uh, out of the crowd and everything. I, I have friends who will be back there uh, who will answer your questions, who will pray with, with you. And, 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 if, and if you're here, and it's the first time uh, you have heard a story about a, uh, about a Savior named Jesus who can help you with your hurt, and you've been walking around with this pain all your life, you come, you find me. You come back there. We want to tell you about Jesus. We want to tell you about how he died for sins and, and, and how he died for the sins of the person who hurt you and how you can walk out of here free from that. And if you don't have it all figured out, don't worry about it. I don't expect you to. You come, you find us. If you want to be part of Brentwood Baptist Church, we'd love for you to be a part of them, this fellowship. You find us back there. You just want somebody to pray with you, you come. We're in no hurry. We're waiting for you. The Lord Jesus, <laughs> he's waiting for you where you are. We'll wait for you as you come. As you bow your head and close your eyes, I don't want anybody moving around. I just want you focused on your own life. I know this is hard. But this is where the rubber meets the road. I believe Jesus is powerful enough to help you deal with your hurt, whatever it is, however deep it is. More than anything, I want you to find that peace and that release. So, Lord Jesus, now, as your children pray, I beg you, don't let anything hinder us from doing now exactly what you're calling us to do. That we can leave here yours, yours, and free. <laughs>